So in this lecture, we're going to be discussing a small step semantics for the if arith language. In the last lecture, we discussed a big step semantics, which corresponds to natural deduction. And this week, we're going to study how can we come up with a more machine implementable version of that semantics. So we're going to talk about some of those different aspects today. One of the first steps towards that is coming up with what's called a small step semantics. All right, so there's code in the description that you can follow along with. I'll be extending it and fleshing it out here to sort of show how the small step interpreter works. All right, so last week we discussed two different semantics for the if arith language. First, we discussed the metacircular interpretation, which is kind of the intuitive interpretation you get from just coding it up in a racket. You're relying on a lot of the racket features, like racket stack, for example, to allow you to do nested function calls, and things like racket's definition of integers and all the operations that go along with that. Racket's uh, implementation of things like the control construct if, for example. All of those things we're kind of borrowing from Racket, and there's kind of a natural correspondence that goes there with our natural deduction semantics that we talked about. So you can sort of see one to the other. Now one thing that we observed in our last lecture was that the big step evaluator for the uh, if arith language has a nice correspondence with the actual natural deduction rules. So every different case in the evaluator has some corresponding rule that it uh, sort of maps to in the natural deduction semantics. All right, so if we're looking to implement the math and think about keeping them in sync, that's one thing that's, that's really powerful. All right, so this week we're gonna be looking at building what are called small step interpreters. Small step interpreters sort of mathematically formalize and form the basis for the textual reduction that I started. Right when I started uh, the class, I described to you this method called textual reduction, which is kind of a sort of recipe-like way to derive the program by textually reducing it and expanding it. Now, we didn't really formalize what that meant. We didn't put down any rules that actually constrained how we had to operate using our natural deduction, or sorry, textual reduction semantics. So today we're gonna to make that a little bit crisper by giving a set of rules that actually show how that can work. All right, so in the big step style, we have this evaluation relation where we would say that a expression like this one right here evaluates to some number in one fell swept all at once. That's kind of the way you read this natural deduction style proof is that you have a whole bunch of stuff above the line and then this statement below the line and the statement just says the program textually reduces to that value. Now in the natural deduction setting and the metacircular interpreter setting, there's no ability for us to talk about really what it means to have some intermediate state of the computation. In the small step style, we're going to do something a little bit different. Instead of having a tree that defines the computation or having Racket's interpreter define the computation, we're gonna do something similar, except we're gonna discuss how the program operates on a step-by-step -step basis. What I mean by that is that the program is going to evolve where it starts in one state or just expression, and then what we're gonna do is we're going to reduce the program in a series of atomic steps that each make a small local change to the program. So we'll define what the rules are precisely in a few more slides, but I just want to get you the high level idea right here. So we have some source expression that we start with. And then what we can do is we can realize that, oh, hey, well, we can reduce this plus two, two here to the number four. We can replace this inside of this expression. We can take a step. Now, we didn't reduce the entire expression all at once. We still have to do some more work. So after we reduce four, we also have to reduce this plus three negative one down here to a two, and then we step to this new state, div four two, which then finally steps to the final state two, which doesn't step to anything else because it's finally a value. You can't really reduce values. They're the kind of irreducible components of the language. All right, so this is kind of an equivalent way of specifying the semantics of the previous thing in the sense that we can produce the same results. We can produce an interpreter that behaves the same except we can do something a little bit more fine-grained than what we can do in the metacircular interpreter. We can inspect the computation at every step along the way, and that's going to be really nice in some cases. It's going to allow us to talk about programs or properties of programs in a way that we really couldn't do if we just had the big step or metacircular interpreter. So for example, if we want to reason about a finite prefix of a program that runs forever uh, via something like an infinite trace, we could do that using this kind of small step semantics. 
or if we want to reason about something like a temporal property of the program, like whether locks are always released after they're acquired, that kind of thing would be a lot harder to do using a big step semantics. We would be able to do it, but we would just have to rework the semantics a little bit to accommodate for it. And so this small step style where we have some state, in this case it's just an expression, but in general it could be something else, but in this case we've got these states that step to other states where they all make one sort of atomic local change, that's a really common pattern for setting up semantics, and that's this small step approach that we're going to learn about today. All right, so to define a small step semantics, we need to define this step operator that tells us how to step from one state to the next. We need to define what states are. That also will be start to be complicated. But at least in our setting right now, it suffices to just have states just be expressions. So every state is just an expression, and this steps to relation, this right arrow, tells us how we can go from one state to the next. And then what happens is we're going to execute this right arrow until we finally get to a value, which can't step to anything because values, by definition, are kind of the irreducible parts of our language. A value is something that you can't really further reduce anymore. Now, in this setting, it works out really nicely. It's not all that hard because there are no lambdas. When we start adding lambdas, that's when it's going to start to get more and more confusing. However, I think it's kind of nice to be able to see these concepts without the more challenging things all at once, so that when you see the more interesting parts of the language, functions namely, those parts will be easier to understand. You won't have all the other kinds of nuance of the semantics kind of going on when you're trying to learn about that. All right, so here's the first observation. If I want to go and take a step from one term to another, all I can do if I want to take an atomic step is perform one operation at once where the operation plus or divide, or if, if it's the guard, the operation has values as its arguments. So I can't step anything related to this top div right here because neither of its arguments are values yet, and so I'm not quite ready to do work. If I know both of the arguments to something like plus or div, then I can just immediately step and reduce those. For example, I can reduce plus to two to four. And then I can reduce the entire expression, oops, the entire expression to div four, plugging this hole right here, correspond to this plus two two, which reduces down to four. That gives me a new term, which is just div four plus three negative one. So we leave this thing alone. And then we reduce this expression next. And now we're just left with a top level term where we just perform this operation right here. And then we step to the answer two. All right, so we immediately evaluate this plus two, two to four, and then we step the whole expression, and then we substitute four in place of the plus two, two. So we took, to take an atomic step, we find what's called a reducible expression, or redux. So we first find, we first identify a redux reducible expression. And this is a term you should uh, commit to memory. It's a term we'll use quite a bit through this course. Redux just means reducible expression. If I ask you to identify a redux or a set of reduxes, the redux is within some uh, term, I'm asking for the set of expressions that can be reduced. And so in this case, we're finding the redux that we want to work on first. There could actually be two of them, although I will say we're gonna add some rules that are going to constrain this a little bit later. So in this case, I'm actually going to give uh, my language this interpretation where we always interpret things left to right. Uh, and so there's no ambiguity, but you could imagine a semantics in which you could also step to uh, plus uh, three negative one. So you actually do this one first. You could imagine a reformulation of the semantics where instead of stepping to work on this first term, you work on the second one instead, right? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a few more slides. All right, so now we've got two rules so far. We've got a rule that says we can immediately reduce uh, plus or div when the arguments are values. We've also got a rule that says when uh, E0 or E1 is not a value, so when we can't reduce the arguments when they're not immediately values, then attempt to reduce them. All right, so start to work on those values. So for example, looking at this term right here, neither of its arguments are values, but we know we can work on the first subterm here to this div. All right, so we can process that one. 
All right, so let's start to translate some of these rules into the natural deduction style and actually come up with formulations of them. And so by the way, I should say in this lecture, I'm introducing a new set of rules. So if you have a set of notes that you're starting to write down, don't look at this set of rules anymore. All right, this set of rules is for the natural deduction big step style. We're gonna introduce a totally new and totally unrelated set of rules. And I'm gonna call this set of rules small if arith. All right, so it's not if arith, that's this set of rules right here. In this lecture, we're gonna be introducing small if arith. And these were totally separate rules from the ones we introduced in the lax lecture. So every time we set up a logical system specified via natural deduction, we're gonna give it a set of rules. In this case, this is a set of rules that just works for the small step semantics. All right, so be careful to differentiate those in your head from the rules that we learned about last week. All right, so the first rule we're gonna have is gonna say that I can immediately apply plus or div when the arguments are both values, so when they're both rational numbers. I think in the last few lectures I said integers actually meant rationals. You have to have that to work out to make divide, sort of get the right semantics. So let's see what this rule says. It says if n0 is a rational number, and if n1 is a rational number, and if n prime is equal to n0 plus n1 in mathematics, then plus of n0 in one steps to n prime. All right, so this says if both of the arguments to plus are just values, which in our language are going to be rational numbers, then you can step to the actual implementation of those values. All right, and so we have two more rules. Uh, we also know that when e0 or e1 is not a value, then we need to continue to reduce it. And so these are slightly more confusing rules than the last one. The last one, uh, both n0 and n1 had to be values. These rules are gonna apply when they're not necessarily values. So first we're gonna attempt to apply this step plus rule. And if that one doesn't work out, if one of the arguments is not yet a value, what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply either plus left or plus right. So plus left is going to let us evaluate something if the uh, left argument to plus or the first argument to plus is not a value. In that case, we're gonna start to work on that and we're gonna take a step to step some of its arguments. All right, in the right-hand side case, this is going to be happening if the left-hand side of the plus, so if the first argument to plus is already a value, in our case, a rational, then we're gonna run this rule plus right. And that's going to allow us to run the right side. And remember, we're not gonna run either of these rules if both of the arguments to plus are a value or a rational number. In that case, we're just gonna immediately evaluate and return. So we're only gonna run these plus left and plus right rules under the circumstance that either E0 or E1 are not yet values. And I also wanna say, notice that here in plus right, uh, there's always an N on the left side. There's not an E0. And this is because uh, it's gonna be an actual number. This is not going to be an arbitrary expression. So if we set up the rules like this, it's going to force us to only ever evaluate the left-hand side of a plus first, and then allow reducing in the right-hand side, because you can never take a step for the right-hand side before you make this left-hand side a value. That's how we've set these rules up if you sort of think about it for a while. All right, so when we take the rules together, they basically say this, they say, to process plus of E0 and E1, first check if both of the arguments are values, and if they are, then perform this step plus rule right here, sum them up and then step to that immediately because you're done, you don't need to make any extra work. If it's not, then we actually need to start reducing their arguments to values. So we said if it is, then check if it's a value, so check if the first one's a value, check if it's a value, if both are, then perform the addition, all right? All right, so when we take all these rules together, we can read them sort of one after another. So this first rule is the first one we want to attempt to apply if we've got a plus expression. We check to see if both of the arguments are values, and if they are, we can just actually perform the addition and just return. So this is an atomic step. Both of the arguments are values. We can sort of do it atomically. Now, if the thing on the left is a value, but the thing on the right is not. So if the first argument to plus is a value, but the second argument to plus is not yet a value, so it's something like you know plus or div of some other expression, well then we're going to step the thing on the right and we're going to continue. Otherwise, if the thing on the left is still not a value, so if the first argument to plus is not a value, then we're going to evaluate E0 by taking a step on E0 and then continuing on. 
All right, so what we're doing is we're sort of diving into the term to find the appropriate place, always looking for the thing on the leftmost side, and then eventually reducing when we figure it out. All right, and these are the three cases you need to actually fully handle plus. Now the rules for div are very similar. It's a very similar operation. All you're doing is you're replacing plus by just this division sign. All right, you're doing the same exact thing though. You're diving through the term. You're processing it from left to right. All right, I would also say, what would happen if we change the rules? So what if we allowed you to also reduce on the right-hand side? Well, if that were the case, then you would be able to step this term right here to both of these outcomes. So under the current semantics, you can only step to this outcome right, uh, right here. Oops, that can't be right. Both of these need to have plus. All right, well, no worries, plus. So right now under our current semantics, you can only step to this second one because you can only process in this left to right order. But if we also allowed the second rule here, you could start to reduce under this right side. So we could do that. There's nothing wrong with setting up the semantics like that. And sometimes you will want to set up your semantics like that. Although I can't say it would be specifically advantageous most of the time, but you could imagine wanting to do that but it would complicate the definition of our step function. And that's because usually we write this function here that's going to take a source expression or a machine configuration in some general case. But for this lecture, it's just going to be an expression and it's gonna take a step and reduce that expression and perform one operation on it. Now, if we have this set of rules make the outcome be non-deterministic, this step function can't return a single expression as its output it has to return a set of, or a list of expressions as its, uh, as its output. And that just gets a lot more complicated and a lot more tricky, um, not a lot more, but a little bit more, enough that it's sort of best avoided. And it also just kind of makes it confusing conceptually. I don't really like the idea that the programming language I'm writing in sort of has some uh, behavior that's determined by a set of things that might happen. I want there to be one precise outcome for the program. And so this has very pragmatic reasons as well. As, as the programmer, you really want to be able to predict that there's one single outcome that's going to happen. All right, and so we've got three more rules for not. So we've got the, a base case right here. So we said, if n is not equal to zero, then we can step not of n immediately to zero because we don't have to do anything to reduce the argument. What about when we have not n and this n is equal to zero? Well, then we can immediately step that one to one. Also don't have to do anything for its argument. But then in general, we might have to dig down into the term. So if we know that e of e prime uh, sorry, if we know that E steps to E prime, then in general, if neither of these two rules apply, we can sort of say that not E steps to not E prime. All right. And finally, we have three more rules for if. So you can see these rules have a very common pattern. They all have this thing where you decide what to do to handle the base case, and then you have to decide what to do to handle the other contexts in which the expression might arise. And we'll talk a little bit more next lecture about how we can sort of exploit this to actually gain a little bit more power and make our interpreter much faster. So we've got these three rules here. This first rule says that if n is not equal to zero and there is some number n right here, then if of n e1 e2 reduces to e1. And this is because e1 is in a tail position for this call, right? After we know that n is not equal to zero, we know the expression is true, and so then we just step to the uh, true case, all right? So we can throw away the entire if because we don't need to do anything after we know that it's the true case, we don't need to do anything to return after e1 is done processing, all right? And then here, similarly for the false case, when n is equal to zero, well, then when we encounter the if case, we can just immediately step to the false case because we knew that the guard was equal to zero. In general though, if we don't know what the guard is, we're going to have to evaluate the guard. So we're gonna step in and we're gonna to try to evaluate the guard. And then when we figure out what that evaluates to and it takes a step, we're then gonna evaluate, and evaluate E0 to then if E uh, and change E0 to E prime and then E1 and E2. Eventually this E0 will then evaluate to either N0 or, uh, sorry, N equals zero or N not equals zero, and you'll take the appropriate if T or if F case. All right, but that won't happen until the guard reduces to a value. All right, so I'll say there are a whole bunch of different rules here. 
Um, I really don't expect you to remember all of these rules. I'm not going to put these specific rules on the exam. If I put rules on the exam, uh, I would actually recapitulate them for you. So I would ask about a particular semantics that I would give you in a self-contained way on the exam. All right, and if you think these rules look kind of unnecessarily complicated, you're definitely not alone. In fact, I would say the actual interpreter itself that we're going to write in a racket in a few seconds makes a whole lot more sense to me than looking at all these different rules. They have a whole bunch of redundancy because they all have this kind of same common structure, which is that they basically dig down into an expression arbitrarily far to find the appropriate redex to operate on. Once they find the correct redex, the sort of leftmost redex to operate on, then they perform some operation and they crawl all the way back up the stack. Right? So that's how all of these rules, that's a kind of common structure. They all have this sort of thing where they're repeating. They have these different variants to handle the different facts that they might be in different contexts. All right, So we're going to see next lecture how we can refactor these rules to avoid this problem where we're constantly diving into the rule, finding the right part of it, and then rebuilding back out. All right. One also very important omission from these rules is that there's no defined transition for values. So when you finally do reach a value, when you reach some output state, you just have to know not to step the interpreter because we just don't say, we don't declare what the next step is, right? It's not a total function. We're not saying that every expression has a next step in the same way that there's no way to step to a definition where you've divided by zero, all right? So we're not defining what happens on values. We just have to recognize that when we hit a value, we're just kind of done. And so what we're doing is we're going to call this step function, and we're going to call it in a loop. We're starting with our source expression. We're going to step, 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 and it's going to evolve one step after the next to some final value. All right, so let's build out this interpreter now. We're going to code it up in a racket. We're going to code up this step interpreter here. All right, so... All right, so I've got the small step interpreter I'm about to code up here. So we've got this function step that's going to take an expression, which we're assuming is not a value, because remember, we can't step any value to anything. It's sort of done. It's the atomic part of evaluation. So we're done once we reach a value. But if we have something that's not a value, we're going to be able to take a step. So what could it be? So uh, let's say it's plus. So that we had three cases with plus. The first case is that both of the arguments are numbers. So when we have a number in one, or sorry, a number in zero and a number in one, we can always just step that to the implementation plus in zero in one. All right, what happens when we have plus of, and then we have uh, in zeros on the left, but then we've got an expression on the right? Well, what we do is we step the right side. So we allow ourselves to take a step inside of e1. All right, so we're assuming that there's some expression down there that's going to be evaluated and take some step. All right, so that's going to result in some answer for us. Otherwise, the last case of plus is that we have some general term where we've got an expression on the left and an expression on the right. And to do that, we're going to step the thing on the left. So we're going to step e0 and then we'll just return e1 right here all right so we're going to do the same exact thing for div except we're going to change the definition so that instead of doing plus we're doing division instead so we'll go through these change that change this to div all right now we need to decide how to handle not so Let's, we have three cases here. So first we've got not of zero. That just steps to one. Another case is that we've got not of number ha in when n is not equal to zero. So not equal ha huh, in zero. When it's not equal to zero, we step to one. Or no, we step to zero, All right? Because this is false. Anything that's not zero is true. So the opposite of true is zero, which is false. All right, otherwise we have not of some expression E zero. And so we just step inside of that expression. So we do not here, and then we step inside of E zero here. All right, and a few more cases because we need to handle if. 
So now we've got if of E0, E1, E2. We actually want to handle another case first. So let's come back to that one. So let's say I've got if of 0, E1, E2. Well, this is false. And we just immediately step to E2. What about if of E0, E1, E2, where this is some number that's not 0? So this is a um, rational, huh? I guess I've been calling these number, huh? So number huh, of n, and this is um, when not equal huh, n, 0. Now we're going to step to E1 because the expression is true. All right. And then we have this one last case to handle here where the guard needs to be stepped. So we've got E0, E1, and E2. And we're just going to step that to step the guard. So step E0, and then E1, and then E2. All right, so let's see if it works. So this needs to be an expert, huh, right here. But otherwise, I think we're decent. Let's see what we've got. Expraha there. Oops, didn't unquote. All right, so with otherwise I think we're good. Okay, so now let's enter an expression and I have this REPL set up right here that will step through and will evaluate the term down to a value given what we've written here. So let's just try out some expressions in C. So, um, oops, need to be typing down here. All right, so one, the final result is one. It doesn't step to anything. What about plus of one and one? Plus of one and one immediately steps to two. All right, what about plus, plus, one, one, plus one, two? All right, so we're going to see this whole thing steps to first evaluate the first expression, 2, right here, and then plus of 1, 2. All right, what about this next expression right here? This is one that I wrote up a few, uh, few minutes ago before class and I thought was particularly useful. All right, so we've got this big expression here. Let's just see what happens step by step. All right, so we've got if... So the first thing we're going to do is calculate the guard. So we're going to calculate that and step it down to 2. And now I need to decide which side of the guard am I going to take. And so I'm going to step and take this right side of the guard right here. Um, so this is the true branch. Let's see, is that right? Oh, no. First we step this guard down to 1. Um, no, no. So we're taking this is the true branch right here. If two, then the whole thing. So yes, so we're taking the true branch here. So then this is what we took here. And so then this entire thing goes down to, evaluates down to one. All right, that looks good. We're taking the true branch here, which is here this. So then this now steps to evaluate Right here, this evaluates just down to one, then the final result is three. All right, so that's how we code up our small step evaluator. All of the rules in our small step evaluator had this common formulation where we basically said, if you have two atomic values, then you can immediately apply the rule and step to a result. Otherwise, dig down and try to figure out what the reducible expression or the redex is. Once you identify that redex, make a small local change and then step back out and rebuild the term. So if we see our rules and we look back through them throughout the lecture, we'll see that all the rules have this kind of common structure. In the next lecture, we're actually going to exploit that. Right now, we're doing a lot of redundant work by diving all back into these terms and then rebuilding them on all the way up, right? And so next lecture, we're going to identify a data structure we can use to avoid having to do all that climbing through the term. And it's going to be our introduction to how we might formalize and then use a stack to do computation. So stick around for that and I'll see you there.